Hey y'all, welcome to Game Day with Heavy Cardboard where we, well, teach, play, and talk medium and heavy strategy board games, war games, 18xx, and today we have a two-player grudge match, and that is for Pax Renaissance, designed by Phil and Matt Eklund, uh, published by Sierra Madre Games, which is Phil Eklund's own publishing house. Today, as I said, it's a two-player grudge match between myself, it's a rematch of sorts, between myself and uh, good buddy, I guess, fellow her member of the herd. There you go. There yeah. you go. Member of the herd, Ash. Hello. Uh, yeah. So let's go ahead and get the chat on the board. And Ash is going to be taking care of all of this today as far as teaching. He did such a great job in the previous one. Uh, this is going to be very similar in that it's going to be, we're going to teach it. Well, and by we, I mean Ash is going to teach it. Uh, Except from the pre, uh, the standpoint of a two-player game, which very small differences. Yeah, right. and we'll go over the differences between the two-player game and the previous four-player game that we played. Uh, but we're also going to do a full rules teach, so that if this is the first video you're watching, it's standalone. All the rules uh, will be encapsulated in this one video. You won't have to go search for multiple videos. So if this is the video you're watching, then you're going to get all the rules you need to play a game of Pax Renaissance. Cool. Do me a favor. Turn the two knobs down. Yep, right there that you're pointing at. These left, two. further left. Left two. Further left, further left. Those These two. two. Down. There. And there. Okay. How's that? How's that as far as volume goes? Uh, I want to make sure that everything is tweaked perfect. This is the first time we've done a two-player yeah. uh, here in the studio, so bear with us. Um, but yeah, as long as the volume's ready to rock, I guess... Um, yeah, I guess there's no reason not to. Uh, cool. There's no reason Thanks, not to Rob. get started. All right, cool. cool. So, uh, do you? Let's yeah. go. Ahead, yeah, we'll go ahead and transition over to the main camera and let's rock and roll. All right. Uh, I'll read the intro that comes straight from the rule book because it does such a good job of giving you a quick introduction, a dunk into the game, as it were. And while you do that, I forgot to turn fans on. I'm going to do that. There we go. Go ahead. As a Renaissance banker, you will finance kings or republics, sponsor voyages of discovery, join secret cabals, or unleash jihads and inquisitions. Your choices determine if Europe is elevated into the bright modern era or remains festering in dark feudalism. Four victories determine the future course of Western society. Will it be towards imperialism, trade globalization, religious totalitarianism, or enlightened art and science? So. That's, that's from the rule book. Um, in the game, we're all, all the players are banking families of Renaissance Europe, late Renaissance, 14, 1500s. And a quick kind of forewarning for this game. Um, there's a lot of information in this game. Uh, it's a fairly dense game and it's a fairly... Mm, opaque? Opaque game, yeah. Uh, it's not easy to see what's going on your first two, three, ten... 10 times around. And so... On that note, I think I'm on my seventh or so game sure. and I'm still learning the ins and outs and trying to get past, okay, wait, I got to do this. Right. When I do this, it's that, that type sure. thing. So even seven games in, it's still tough yeah. at times, right? And yeah. And opaque. You're still on the learning curve right. 10, games, 10 games in and I feel like I am too. So That said, we can't explain everything up front or else it'll all just be gibberish. Yep. Um, so we'll try to explain what we can and then get straight to playing so that you can see things in action and we'll explain things as we go while we're playing uh, in the hope that it can make a little more sense when you're seeing it happen real time. So uh, to start explaining, I'll begin with the table itself, what you see on the table. So here in the middle, you see a map of Europe. Each card represents a region in the map of Europe. You have uh, each kingdom is, has a name, England, France, Holy Roman Empire. It has cities on it. Hungary has Budapest and Bel Belgrade. Excuse me, back then it was Belgrade. Right. Uh, on the map cards themselves, you're going to see pieces. Um, these are knights, uh, white and black right now. These cylinders are called rooks when, within the game. In between the map cards, you will see cubes of each player color, and the game refers to those as pawns. In this particular location, those pawns are a trade concession, which, again, 
I know a lot of this is Greek. We'll get to the details of it. <laughs> uh, also on the map cards, you see these white and black lines. These are the trade routes running through medieval Europe. The white is the west trade route corresponding to this white uh, card back here, beginning in Trebizond and running all the way around Europe and terminating in the Holy Roman Empire. The east trade route, the black line corresponding to this black deck of cards, begins in Tana and runs through the Bosporus whoop, and ends in Mamluk. Very wee. It, for now, it's wee. Now, during the course of the game, those origination points may change, uh, and that may change the scope of the game. Or it may not. Uh, the next most important part of the table, you can see just peeking in from the side, are the four potential victory conditions alluded to in the intro to the game. Um, I will say that they are potential because in the due course of the game, they may or may not get activated. And I won't go into any more detail about them now, other than suffice to say, there's four. Any one of the four may or may not get activated, depending on what the players in the game do. Um, and generally speaking, they relate to either trying to get empires into your tableau, trying to get the most trade concessions, uh, or trying to have the most republics, which is another kind of empire or a different flavor of empire. Sure. Or lastly, um, having the most prestige of the supreme religion within the game, which that's a whole mess of unpack. That's a Gordian knot of terminology uh, that we'll unpack later. Um, I'll also mention that today we're playing the game, just the base version of the game. We're not using the expansion. Uh, Edward has the expansion yeah, here. Yeah, and I'll show you guys this. So the expansion actually comes with 60 cards. It says so right here. So it's, I mean, obviously this being a card game, right? it's all cards. So all 60 of these are out of the game. You will never see them today. on this live stream. Yeah. Cool. Maybe for our third playthrough. Maybe. So... That's the map. Oh, real quick, oh, before, sure. you, oh, before you go any further, did you mention living rules, rule book, that type uh, sure. of thing? Figure, touch on it, because yeah. I know people are going to ask about so, it. So, um, Phil Eklund and Sierra Madre Games especially maintain living rules. Uh, you can access them on Board Game Geek, and for Pax Renaissance, as far as I can tell, the living rules amount to um, the level of rules changes that you would get from clarifications and answers to FAQs. Uh, I couldn't see any just major shifts of rules from the online, uh, live, or uh, living set of rules, or the one in the rule book. It just helps clarify questions the same way an FAQ would. Cool. Um, so, yes, we are playing with the living rules. No, it does not depart from what you know of as the rules, except to answer some questions that we had in our first four or five games. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, so, that's we've covered now the map of Europe broken into 10 different sections, each with their cities and map pieces, uh, the pieces that live between the map cards, and the four victory conditions. Now, each of these 10 map cards has a corresponding empire that Edward and I will likely be fighting over. Uh, we have, we've broken them into the west set here, which is these six empires, west side. and the east set here, these four empires. East side. <laughs> uh, the, no. I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, there's somebody watching this video goes, there goes that guy with the goofy beard yep. interjecting again. All right, sorry, continue. Uh, they'll, they'll fast forward 10 seconds. It's fine. Uh, the last two parts of the, of the table anatomy, we have the markets. There's a West market, which is the set of cards on a conveyor that are available for Edward and I to purchase. This is the main meat of the game. These cards are the main way that we'll be interacting with the game. And the East market down here, the black backed cards. Uh, the difference between a four-player game and a two-player game, one of the differences is there's fewer cards in each of the draw decks. Um, when you set it up, it's you make the Comet set, which is 12 cards plus two Comets, and on top of those 14, uh, go four cards per player. So in this case, there's only eight cards before we get to the Comet zone. Which last live deck. stream, there were 16. So exactly. that's really the, the main difference. That's the only difference. And the um, amount of money we start with. Well, right? and... Uh, we randomly determined that Edward as the Medici would go first, and so the starting player always gets three Florins. Uh, next player after that gets four. In our case, there's nobody after that, so nobody else. there's nobody else there to get more money to start with. Uh, so we've covered the map, 
the, the empires, the victory conditions, and the two markets. Lastly, there's the money. We're playing with the game money. These are florins in the theme of the game, but uh, fives and ones. But suffice to say, it's the only currency within the game beyond power and influence. And influence, effectively, um, as befitting a game of banking. Uh, so that's what's on the table. So now I'm going to tell you what you can actually do on your turn. On your turn, you can do two actions, only two. Uh, of those actions, you can buy a card from the market, which we'll get into how that happens. You can play a card. Oh, sorry, when you buy a card from the market, you buy it into your hand. One of the other things you can do is you can play a card from your hand to your tableau, and uh, we'll get again. We'll get into the details of these. Uh, one of the, your actions can be to run a trade fair, um, and that when you do so, you will dictate, I'm running the West Trade Fair, or I'm running the East Trade Fair. One of your actions can be to run the operations, or the ops, uh, in your tableau. And again, you would say, I'm running my West Ops, or I'm running my East Ops. Uh, we'll get to those. Um, and actually, I'll show them on my tableau. Yeah, yeah you'll get to see Edward's later, tableau, right? and, I'll, and I'll flash my cards at you as though you can zoom in and read them. Yep. Um, additionally, you can sell a card from your hand or your tableau for two florins. And that's important because your hand limit is two. You can only have in your hand two cards. And I emphasize that just because when I play, I always get distracted by, ooh, I Shiny. want this next card. <laughs> I already have two cards in my hand. Yep. I can't buy it. And the game says you strictly cannot buy cards into your hand if you're at your hand limit. If you want to do so, you can do one of the aforementioned actions to get cards out of your hand so that you can go and chase that. Uh, the last action that is available to you on your turn, one of your two actions, is you can claim victory. Um, I'm told this is typical of all the PAX series games. That no. on your turn... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. That Continue. on your turn, you must use one of your actions to seize victory. That's, that's not in PAX Porphyriana. Oh, okay. And all that right. really tripped me up the first... I don't know, handful of times I played this. <laughs> because you're always on the cusp of victory, and then, oh, I don't have the action to take it. And then by the time it comes back around to you, situations have changed, and now all of a sudden I can't win the game yep. because I no longer have the lead and what I need, or so on and so forth. Right. So that's what you can do on your turn. Buy a card to your hand, play a card from your hand to your tableau, run a trade fair, east or west, run your ops, east or west, sell a card, and claim victory. Now, I'm going to describe the anatomy of the market cards themselves, and then uh, cover a few more details, and then we'll start playing, uh, because any more lo any more detail than that would be overflow. TMI, yeah. So, all of the cards yeah, have. Here, let me let me go and zoom in. Oh yeah, we good can call. Move it, so, do you want to put them in the middle? Yeah, super. There you go. Let's see, there's one, and. There's one. And the and chat while we're at it is, is talking about a few of the differences on living rules. Again, edge case sure. stuff to where, honestly, it's just not worth going into in a playthrough, yeah. I feel like. Um, so we'll be playing with the living rules. And to my way of thinking, that's playing with the clarifications that, that, the rule, that those clarify. Yeah. So all of the cards uh, in the game will have a name. Oh, thanks. All the cards in the game will have a name, a nice little picture, and flavor text that all together probably amounts to a college-level college, co college level course on medieval Europe. But ignoring that, it has a name. It'll have a brown banner listing the agent and the type of piece that that agent is. It might have a prestige icon up here. But at the bottom, you will have a one-shot, which is this bomb icon there, there, and there, and the name of the one-shot. And either above or below that, it'll have the operations or the ops icons for that card. This one you see here is a commerce, there is a siege, uh, this one doesn't happen to have any, and that's, that sometimes happens. And Here's a good example of one that has several, in addition to the, op, the one shot. Now, almost all of the cards will also have a location listed on them, either England, uh, France corresponding to one of the map cards, or it might also have a location corresponding to a larger region on the map, the east, which is the eastern four cards, or the west, the western six cards. And that location is 
important to take note of when you're playing because that's where that card is going to interact with the game, whether on its one shot or on its uh, operations icon. That's where that card is kind of affecting or acting upon the game. And so when you're when you're looking at the cards in your marketplace, uh, take note of their location, take note of their operations, and take note of their one shots. Um, that's all. Oh yeah, that that's all. <laughs> that that's it. Um, Very quickly, um, I want to cover the details of when you play a card, the agents. Uh, I think this, uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's fine. When you play a card, um, you have the option to execute the one shot, the bomb icon on the bottom, if it has one. Most of them do. If you choose not to, you then have the option to place the agents that are listed on the card. Um, and occasionally a one-shot doesn't include the agent, and so that's, uh, that's the game's way of telling you, if that agent's not involved in the one-shot, now's your chance to play the agent. Right. Uh, the agents kind of continue the chess theme that's underlying the game. On the board you have rooks and knights, you've seen pawns as well. Uh, the kingdoms, or the empires, are the kings. Those are the kings of the game. Shocker. Go figure. Uh, this is a very fortunate tableau because here we have queens uh, in both the east and west markets. Um, the queens are the way to capture a king. Uh, you additionally have uh, knights and rooks that will be agents on a card, and, to complete the analogy, bishops, uh, which move, as in chess, kind of move diagonally to the whole rest of the game. And we'll, we'll discuss how they happen uh, when they come into play here. Um, just very briefly, before, before we, we begin playing, and I think we can, there's a number of player aids on BGG, on BoardGameGeek.com. Um, there's several. Uh, they all look quite good. They all do something different. These uh, are just text. They don't incorporate any of the iconography. Others of them uh, do incorporate the icons of the game to kind of help make it a little more legible. And uh, I know. need these still. Oh. Eight, seven, eight plays in. Yeah. I need I the use, player aids. I use Absolutely. them now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, in my, in my eighth, eighth and ninth game, I had my nose in the rule book. And uh, the only reason I won't now is because we're streaming. But there's always some new nuance or wrinkle or edge case that the rules cover um, that you may encounter or you may try to avoid encountering. Right. And on that, I'll include that the rules have a very good walkthrough of all the kind of game anatomy in addition to an alphabetized glossary of terms. And so while we're playing, we're going to uh, do our utmost to use the glossary, use the terms within the game, so that when you hear that term of art, you can go to the glossary and look it up and understand it better. Then on the back side is a very, very good chart uh, discussing the different kinds of regime change. Uh, some of them are one shots, some of them are not. Uh, and what the, uh, what the potential effects of those kinds of regime change are all right. Lag. Yep. Hold yep. on. For some reason, we're lagging right now. So give us a minute and we'll be right back. So stand by, guys. Hey, y'all. Welcome back. Or I guess we're welcoming ourselves back or something like that. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, live, the joys of live. So you want to back it up about 10, 15 seconds and, and go ahead. Exactly. We had a little lag, so we're just going to back it up. Um, I think to... Card anatomy? No, not that far. Okay. Not even. All right. So uh, we'll cover. We'll back it up to the rule book. During the game, we're going to take special care to use the terminology that the rule book includes. And the rule book is very good in that it describes uh, kind of in order of operations the entire uh, set of the game and all the operations and terms within the game. And at the back of the rule book is an alphabetized glossary. Uh, and so as we're playing, we're going to make sure that we use those special terms of art. So when you hear them, you can go to the glossary, look it up if you need to, um, and kind of re-reference back within the rulebook. On the back is also a very, very good chart showing how the different kinds of regime change uh, can play out depending on particular variables. Uh, it also describes who participates as an attacker or a defender in each of the types of regime change, be it conspiracy, peasant revolt, religious war, or a plain old campaign. Yeah, this is invaluable, and we'll be referencing this throughout the game. Exactly. Cool. So, uh, 
I know we didn't detail how to buy cards from the market or how to run a trade fair or even why you would want to. Um, we'll do that as we're playing uh, and kind of narrate and describe as we go. So, Edward, you're the first player. Cool. Uh, if you're ready to buy a card as your first action, then yeah. All you right. can. So, here we go. We're starting. So, just to give you guys an idea of what we're looking at as far as starting money and everything. So, I start with three florins. Again, uh, Ash pointed out, I am the Medici, which flavor-wise is the only thing that uh, that that matters yeah. as far as that, that and my player color, which obviously yellow. So, there we go. Um, yeah, let me fix the chat as well. Give me one sec, guys. There and we while, go. while he's doing that, I'll point out that the game comes with its own player aid on the back side of your player card, showing the icons for the ops and the one shots, and very, very briefly what they actually do. But we'll right. talk through each of those as we encounter. Yeah. So apparently uh, there's going to be lag for some reason today. So we apologize, huh. but we're going to just try and power through it and see how it goes. Okay. All right. So on my first action, uh, my options are I could run the trade fair. I could buy a card. Mm -hmm. I can't play a card because I have no cards to right. start. So I'm. this is actually the first time I'm really taking a look at what I have for options. Um, I like the idea of getting empires. So I think I will... Um, Let's see, France, England. Yeah, why not? So I'm going to go ahead and spend. So when you buy a card, you put a florin onto the marketplace on that market. And, and that's this face down card here. If I wanted to buy, for instance, Joanna here, I would then place a florin on every card prior to it to then take that card. Take that card. However, Edward I'm is not that wisely aggressive. taking the cheaper coronation. Right. I will take Mary the Rich. Now, the reason Edward's taking that card is the one shot on it. Those queen cards, the only reason to take it is the one shot, the coronation one shot, which is the most direct way to get an empire from the empire stack into your tableau. It's which, the kind of easiest, most direct route. Which you're about to find out how that works here in a little bit. So the first thing, next thing for my second action is I'm going to play two coins, two florins, and I'm going to take uh, Esbita. Uh, Bohemia, which is another, well, you know what, hold on one second. That is in England, it's a little far on the trade route. Um, but you know what, actually, on second thought, I will not. I will actually buy the second card, and this actually gives a good example sure. of how to go about doing that. So, we put one on the trade route. I would normally put one here, but as you can see, there's no card. And the conveyor does not have uh, convey. It does not move until the end of my turn. Right. So instead, the florin actually comes down here to the Duke of Athens, which is the same card in the first spot. And then I will choose this card into pick. my hand. Nice. So um, the way that a player player turn works is you take your two actions, and then you have a market refresh, what we call the conveyor, partly because it lets us do fun fun sound effects. As the conveyor moves down, set of cards available for you to purchase. And so that's Edward's turn. That's his whole first turn. So I now have two cards in my hand. I cannot take any more cards into my hand until I remove these two cards, either through soiling them or playing, playing them. them. All right. So um, let's see. This is my first time really, really looking at the cards, too. So you have a coronation here. Yep. You have a coronation here. Uh, let's see. You and have another coronation. Wow, there's a lot that came out. Um, uh, a couple of bishops. There's a possible concession up here in England. Uh -huh. And yeah, that's about it. Yep. Well, there's bishops and stuff, and, and there's a knight, but, and a rook. But. Important mm. note, while Ash studies the cards real quick, if he were to purchase the Duke of Athens down here, he would play one, pay one florin onto the East Trade Route, which is the first card in the conveyor, and then he would then take this card. He also would get any florins that are attached to it, i.e. on top of it from anything that we have bought. Exactly. And so in that way, cards that are getting skipped over become more valuable and more enriching for you to take, even to kind of offset the perceived uh, lack, lack of value on the card's face. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to try something a little different. I'm going to purchase uh, Carlotta, 
Loose. Yeah, I, I'm going to butcher these all day. One of our other house rules is that we always have to at least attempt to pronounce yes. the name on the card. <laughs> so I'm going to purchase uh, Carlotta Louisiana of Cyprus. So that's, again, mm -hmm. to buy a card of the market. You put a card, you put a florin on the first card of the market and every subsequent card until you reach the card that you're purchasing. Whoop. And then it comes into hand. And uh, for my second action, I'm going to play it. All right. So, so here, I'll zoom out a little bit so you guys can see his so tableau. So here's, okay. here's how the coronation works. On... On the queen card, Here, let me in see the one shot, I will show them. In the one shot coronation, it shows you, it'll tell you which empires are available for you to marry this queen to to gain that empire into your tableau. Um, they must be in the class. stack for them to be available for a coronation. Um, and we may get to see that here in a little bit. But uh, your three one, options are Mameluke, yeah. Byzantium, and the Ottoman Empire. So you can choose one of them. I, and because of the fact that it's the first empire being played, all three of these obviously are, are available right now. Right. I will take the Ottoman Empire, thank you, please and thank you. And so that comes out of the empire stack and into my tableau here. When you run a coronation one shot, uh, the queen and king are paired like this. Oh, are paired like this. Uh, the, the game manual calls it the cruciform pattern, so that you can still see any prestige or ops icons that are on the queen card, in addition to the name and location and uh, anatomy of the king card that you've just gained. Uh, the other part of the cards is a tiny little arrow at the bottom that tells you which side of your tableau that card goes into when you play it. On the empire cards, it says east, right here in the bottom, bottom left-hand corner, on the, on the other cards, it's in the bottom center. A little arrow saying west or east. Yep. And that's my turn. So uh, we were... Hold on, you get to place a concession oh, because you, you yes. took the king. Uh, so, the king. Go ahead. Sorry. Whenever there's a kind of regime change, and coronation is one of them, that grants you a concession on the map bordering that empire. And so my options are here. Uh, I married the, or had a coronation for the Ottoman Empire, and so my choice is here or here. Technically, that's a choice, too. I could pay a florin to repress this cube. However, it's my own. It doesn't benefit me whatsoever to do so. So instead, I'll place my trade concession here. And the way that map borders work, um, outside the map, it, map cards is not a border. It's those spaces between map cards. Correct. And thematically, that represents how the pawns of the game, or the merchants, kind of live between uh, the, two, the two empires uh, listed on the map. And so that's my turn. I bought a card and I played a card and then in doing so executed the agent listed on the empire card there, which that little multicolored cube is how you know you're getting a trade concession. It's a square, it's the four, color, four player colors and represents that you as the player are getting to place that agent. All right, so for my turn, he's gonna refresh the market. And then for my turn, <coughs> I have these cards in my hand now and I would like to play them. So I shall do so. And I think that is a wonderful idea. Oh, I will, I will play one of them. So I, saw, right. you, I saw you took that one. Yeah, so I will play Mary the Rich. Mary, one R. Uh, the Rich, it's a coronation, just yeah. like what we saw, except it's France, England, Portugal, or the HRE. And looking at this, doo -doo -doo, I will go ahead and choose... Sir, may I recommend... Yeah, I'm going. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm good with that. So I will choose Portugal here. So I will take Portugal from the Empire stack that goes uh, on top of the Queen, which then gives me, importantly, this symbol, which is a navigation. Um, I forget the exact prestige. Term, uh, yeah. Prestige navigation. This is important. You'll understand why here in a moment. But because it was a regime change, i.e., the kingdom or the mm -hmm. empire came into play. I now get a concession for Portugal. So then looking at, so I take one of my uh, my concessions or peasants and I must play it either here for Portugal or here. And because I know what is coming. And I do too. I right. Um, because of the cards that I've already bought from yeah. the market, I will place it up here in between Portugal and England regarding uh, which is on the tr in between the trade route on the northern side of Portugal. Right. 
And the reason for that, you might wonder. And the reason that I uh, offered up Portugal like a sommelier. Right. Is I am also going to play as my second action, the Company of Merchant Adventures, which again is on the west side right here. So here's the other kind of trade shift. Most, or excuse me, the one shots. Most of the one shots, coronations, peasant revolts, um, conspiracies, conspiracies jihads, and religious cetera, wars right. are some, a, some kind of attempt at regime change. Uh, some are automatic, some are not. But those are all some kind of try at a regime change. Trade shift is the one one shot that is not. A trade shift is uh, the way that I mentioned before that the trade routes might change their origination point, And in this case, will do so. Now, all right. So here we go. So the company of Merchant Adventures, the very first thing that happens is I can choose to trigger the, the one, one shot, shot, which is the bomb symbol right here, which is a trade shift to the Spice Islands. However, to be able to do that, you must have a navigation prestige prior to playing it. So this one will not count. However, oh, looky here, we got this with Portugal. So a trade shift. So let me show you what's going to happen with this. Yep. So right now, the current uh, West trade route starts here in Trebizond. Yeah. Go with it. Um, follows the white line, comes down around, do, 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 up through all the way to the HRE. Well, if you notice, somebody, I'm not going to name any names, Ash, has uh, concessions on the trade route early on. Right. Whenever you fire, uh, do the, uh, the uh, host a trade fair. Yeah. yeah. Or, be, or do a trade fair action. All the concessions get paid along the trade route. Well, Starting at the top. Which I don't like you getting paid. All these others. I can't imagine why. All the others, the black one again, as you explained, comes down here to Mamluk. The, the discs here are busted. Go right. ahead and take it from there. So, um, when the game begins, both of the trade routes originate in the Byzantium Empire and flow as along their did. area. Yeah, as they did at the time. And flow along the arrows in and around Europe. Um, changing that, uh, we haven't seen a trade fair, so you won't really see the, the um, kind of implications of this. But what Edward's doing is he's making sure, trying to play for a monopoly along the white trade route. What he'll instead do is the Spice Islands will be the new origination point. This Emporia, busted Emporia, will go over Trebizond and cover up the spot, which will explain why that's important when we get to it. But now the white trade route only starts here in Portugal, uh, excuse me, yeah, starts here you. in Portugal and flows up around and er, ends in the HRE, completely cutting off the entirety of the Mediterranean. Uh, so, Which benefits me because I'm going to get you're paid on there. and you do not get paid right. for well, that. For now. Right. Now, so, the, oh, uh, the other thing now, uh, now that we have changed, the, we've had the trade shift, now the second thing that I may opt to do is put out the... the uh, Your agent. Yeah, thank the, you. The agent onto the board. So... It is a pawn, which is going to be a concession. Right. Uh, and the any color just means of that player's color, and it must border England. All right, so we come back out here, and we look at England. I only have two options. Mm -hmm. I have here and here. Well, I'm not going to repress my own concession. Naturally. So instead, oh, somebody's getting paid. How about that? So we now have two concessions. For England, I have played two cards. The turn of the Medici. Is finished. And if I'm pronouncing it wrong, I apologize. All right. Neither right. of us are medieval European we, 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 Italians. Not so much. So, all right. Go for it. So. Oh, and note, I did not take any cards out of the market. Ergo, it does not There's refresh. no refresh. Exactly. Um, <laughs> when the market refreshes, it is to fill any blank spaces created during that player's turn. Right. Which I'm going to do so now. Because I'm going to run a trade fair, just partly just to show y'all how it works. Uh, trade fairs are one of the primary ways to get money back into your coffers within the game. Uh, if you can see, um, or if, you, if you could see, um, my coffers are empty. I spent, <laughs> I spent all the money I had to get this queen and to get this empire into my tableau. So, so that would be an expensive dowry? It was very expensive. <laughs> uh, so uh, one of the prime ways to get money back into your coffers is by running a trade fair upon which you have trade concessions. And we'll, we'll demonstrate that now. I'm going to run the east trade route, and here I'm going to verify 
One of the other things that changes in a two-player game is how much money comes oh, out of the bank call. I think it's called China right. in, the, in the rule book, um, thematically representing the source of all this wealth flowing into Europe via the spice trade, etc. Uh, and so when you run a trade fair in a four, three- or four-player game, you pull out two florins. However, in a two-player game, let's make... Yeah, I'm 100% hundred percent. Yeah, 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 no doubt. You pull um, out one florin from from the bank to add to the market. Which. So what he's going to be doing is because he is initializing the east trade fair, uh, trade route or trade fair. He is going to start here. He will pay any pieces, whether they're concessions or pirates, in between each of the map cards down to the uh, either you run out of money or it reaches the destination of the trade fair. Right. And so in a two player game, we're going to pull one florin out of the bank and add it to the market. Now you begin the trade fair by paying first the instigator of the trade fair. Hi, that's me. <laughs> one florin. And then you pay every concession right. along the route. And so we start here in Tana and follow the black line. There's nobody there, no peace there. If there were a pirate, which would be represented by a rook, that pirate would get paid and would take a florin. We now get to the next uh, trade concession. We pay it. Uh-oh, the trade fair's out of money. And so it ends here in, in the map border between Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. Before it got. Before it got Ottoman, to the Ottoman Empire. Or Mammoth. And that's important Mammoth. because whenever you run a trade fair, you start by discarding, well, you start by adding money, you then discard the card from the bottom of the market, and then you conduct what's called a levy in each map card where the trade fair was profitable. And so in our, in our example, that's these two map cards. And a levy is whenever a levy happens, either via trade fair or later on via tax, that means placing a piece onto the map matching one piece per card of the pre-printed type. Uh, here the, uh, the three options are there, but that's covered up and this is already full. And so in Byzantium, there's only one option to place the white knight there in Kaffa. In Hungary, there's two options, but one of them is already full, and so the only other option is to place a red knight there in Belgrade. The trade fair stopped paying out here, and so the Ottoman Empire does not receive a levy. Nor does Mamluk for that Nor matter. does Mamluk, right. And he does not get paid for your concession. For, for my second it didn't concession. Say. Your right. second action. Now, note, this does not refill. This does not, the conveyor does, does not, not happen. Right, yet. the market refresh does not occur until the end of my turn. Um, so, with my two newly minted florins, I think that it's my imperative to begin attacking Edward's western uh, control over there. I completely disagree. Um, but I think instead, what I'm actually going to do, I think what I'm going to do is run my west ops. Now, we mentioned one of the main ways to get money into your coffers is with the trade fair. In a four-player game, you're likely to be paying your opponents just as much as you're paying yourself. The other way to get money is with your ops. Ops come in four different flavors. Yellow is commerce, which just gets money into your, into your coffers from the market. Uh, purple is political and has all sorts of different things. Blue is religious and generally affects moving uh, bishops. Or being able to, the ability to hush or silence cards. Right. Um, and then the last type is red, which is military, generally killing pieces on the map board uh, and possibly taking over empires. So what I'm going to do now is run my ops. I only have cards in my east tableau, so I'm going to be running my east ops. And at that, you technically have two cards right. in the east. So when you run ops, you may optionally run one icon per card. And so my queen here has two options, either a commerce or a siege. Um, and in that case, the location for the queen, since it's not pre-printed, is the location of the kingdom to which the queen's attached. So I'm not interested in sieging in the Ottoman Empire, but sure? I am interested. Are you yeah, sure? I'm real sure. Because sieging kills pieces it's my own. off. Right. right, and weakens it and makes it easier for me to take it over. Right. Uh, generally speaking, within the game, map pieces on the board represent stability within that empire. Uh, later, we'll see map pieces or uh, pieces on a card or on the empire card that generally represents instability within that empire. 
Knights represent aggressive capability of an empire, and rooks uh, generally are defensive, but also just kind of add to the stability of said empire. Castles. Yeah. Kind of, you, I mean, they castles are rooks and nobility. Yeah, look exactly. like castles. It kind of makes sense. Right. So, uh, my ops for my queen, I'm going to run the commerce op, and the way commerce works, it'll say east or west, and you then take one florin from any of the market cards. And, you know, I don't want Edward to be getting paid to take this card, so I'll be taking the florin from here. Uh, in our game accounting, we, we pay onto the op just to kind of help ourselves track, track our ops. Once the tableaus get bigger, you'll see yeah. why that's helpful. I'm then going to campaign with the Ottoman Empire, and I'm excited because... So, you want me to run through what a campaign does, or do you want to go ahead and... Uh, I'll do it. Okay, go for it. So, the way a campaign works is it generally, or it specifically represents this particular empire attacking one of its neighbors. Real quick, before you start here, sure. let me show folks. Oh, yeah. So, all right, so oh, if you notice table. right here, and I can't really zoom in right now on this, but campaign op, it has to do with knights on the map. Yep. And it has to do with knights adjacent and rooks adjacent here. And then it says what happens for the battle resolution right here. So really, really handy. I'll let you take over from there, but Thanks. figure I would yeah. reference that so, for folks. Uh, when you're campaigning, uh, on the campaign op icon is a florin minus per knights. So you're going to pay one florin per knight on the map card. Every knight takes part in the attack. So you're, you're going out to battle. So... There's two Florins for my two knights. I'm going to attack my, fr my neighbors, the Mamluk Empire. So, the way that attacking and, and defending works, generally speaking, here there's two attackers, my two knights, and there's one defender. P pieces kill each other one to one in this case, and so one knight will kill one rook. Thank you. This way it gives them a, a better background than the black. Yep. So one oh, knight... Good call. One knight has killed one rook, so one offensive versus one, one defensive. defensive. Now, okay. there is a surviving attacker, which means that this campaign was successful. Congratulations, boo on you. Thank you, and for having a successful campaign, that triggers a regime change. I attacked the Mamluk Empire, and so I take the Mamluks out of wherever they were. If they were in Whether my it's tableau. in your tableau, someone else's tableau, in this case, the Empire or, stack. Or... or your own tableau. Or your own tableau. That's also a valid attack. Um, oh, let me zoom out a little sure. bit more so they can see vessels. So, in, into, my, into my tableau comes uh, the Mamluk Empire as a vassal to the Ottoman Empire. And that's why it's physically below, below the Ottoman Empire. the piece. Empire. Uh, again, here's a regime change. Whenever an Empire card moves, be it within your tableau or from one person to another. When, whenever it moves around, that's a regime change. Or flips. Or flips. To the Republic side. To the Republic side. Uh, that triggers a regime change, which means you get to place another tasty, tasty concession. Uh, that's bordering the Mamluk, and again, I don't want to repress my own, so I'll just put it here. Trade concessions along land borders, rather, trade concessions along map borders where there is no trade route aren't that profitable. You're never going to get paid from them, but they help with um, some of the kind of uh, operations within the game you may be trying to pursue later on, be it the globalization victory or trying to create republics. All right, so that was both your actions, or was it just one? Oh, you ran the trade fair, and then you... I ran the East Trade Fair, and I ran East Ops, so now we're going to refresh the market. This card is then discarded. And the money follows that card, correct? Right. And same if you notice these just shift down so the money stays on those. Yep. Cool. All so right. now it's your turn. <sighs> All right. Well. Interesting. Uh, so sieging comes into play here to be able to... But, oh, in the east, to boot. Um, I'm broke. I just realized that. Okay, so I am going to, uh, yeah, so um, uh, we're going to try and keep the money on the cards. So you can see I have zero money, 
um, that not a good place for a banker to be. So we are going to fix that. So we will go ahead and run the West trade route. All right. So it originally started there. Now, uh, because of the trade shift, it starts here in the Spice Islands. So we add one onto the West trade route. It starts here. I get one for being the cool guy that actually triggered the trade, uh, the trade fair. Trade fair. Yeah. Thank you. I, dude, trade route, trade fair. Yeah. All right. So we follow the white line, and it always goes clockwise for the uh, for the west trade route. Right. So it comes up. Boom. Oh, look at that. It hits me. It comes through this car. Oh, look. Boom. It hits me. Boom. And it makes it all the way well, to the HRE. Actually, it's oh, no, it here. doesn't. I'm this sorry. It's stopped there because it's out of money. Paid. Good call. So we. Uh, we add levies mm -hmm. now to all the cards. So my only option is a black rook there. Here, my only option is a white knight, which I am in favor of uh, hoping to take over England here in a little bit. And then I have a choice here as far as whether or not I well, want a white knight. the trade fair didn't get oh, past that. Oh, sorry, never mind. No worries. All right, so it stops here. Good call. And when placing levies is the only time when the map piece pre-printed on the card matters. If when you're placing an agent and you have the opportunity to place it on that map card, what's pre-printed there or what's even there doesn't actually matter. So we could place a white rook here. Or, exactly. Or, or, if or you had an nose, agent to place in France. Exactly. Cool. All right. All right. So my second action. Um, yeah. I, uh, this one time, can I take three actions? Right. Um, Wow, there's there's the spirit in, the spirit of Paul Chad is with you. Yes, uh, so I will go ahead and spend one florin, place it on the East Trade Route. I thought and, you might do that. Uh, Elsbita of Bohemia, yep. I shall claim. Plus, I get the one florin to boot. That is my second action. I now have one hand card, so I'm a little bit more freer for what I want to do for the next turn. Right. We refill both sides. Yep. And Griefill comes from uh, a a uh, a error on the oh original Wildcatters uh, player Ruler. aid, oh, and yeah. it just kind of stopped. Stuck. So we call it Griefill nowadays. All so right. uh, I'll narrate that we now have our first comet appearing, and comets are the card oh. when purchased. If I could, real quick, sure. I totally missed it because the trade oh, yeah. fair is existing. I forgot. Good call, Peanut Gallery. Um, you could have put a white. I could have, and I. I you will do so. Okay. <laughs> Good call. There we go. Cool. Instead of that one when I did the levy. Continue. Yeah. So, comets are the cards oh, wow. that when purchased by a player is how we choose to activate one of the floor, one of the four uh, victory conditions. Um, if it's not chosen, then that's one less victory condition that's going to get activated. It's still at the top of the market, but it's out there. Cool. And somebody's asking about uh, Pax Porfiriana and Premier. They will be coming playthroughs down the road for sure. So what are you thinking? So what I'm thinking is that I have and I have the it. Ottoman no, Empire. No. <laughs> I have the Ottoman Empire and I need to expand because you are clearly well positioned to continue expanding and continuing to profit there in the West. I um, don't know what you mean, uh, yeah. Ash. Oh, I know where you're going with that. Do you? I think I do. Okay. Perhaps I'm wrong. Perhaps. So, I think what needs to happen is that I'm going to run the East Trade Fair again. and Because you only have one floor in I'll, as Yeah, I only right. have one floor in right okay. now. Okay. I'll try. Cool. There oh, it is. There you There's go. my yeah, one yeah, floor yeah, in. Perfect. Right there. Hello. <laughs> so, it wants I'm going to run the East Trade Fair. So, I'll start by paying myself, the instigator. I'll then pay, there's no concession there, pay myself again, and pay the last blue trade concession here. And in this case... It seems awfully selfish of you, I'm just saying. You know, um, <laughs> pot, pot, the pot and the kettle right. is all I, I can I, say. I, I didn't say mine wasn't, I simply said that yours was. So, now we, would now we raise a levy in every map card paid. However, Byzantium and Hungary are saturated. In the game, that's called saturated when all the potential cities for map pieces to go on is full. So no levy is raised. However, Ottoman will get, I will take a black knight. Thank you very much. Oh, that's right. So Constantinople can take <laughs> two tried. knights and a black rook. He did try. <laughs> and I will also add a black rook to Mamluk. 
and should point out real quick sure. also while you're thinking about your second action here is the only time the colors of the pieces matter is when it comes to whenever you're doing anything religion related right uh there are three religions in the in the game right. there's yeah. uh islam there is christianity and there is uh just the Protestants. Yeah. Right, right. The the black map pieces represent the Muslims, the white map pieces represent Catholics, and the red map pieces represent the Protestants. I'll be taking this card, the Savafids, into my hand, and we'll detail what happens when I play it. Oh, you, wait, let me see it real quick. I missed it. Oh, it's, that's fine. Okay. No worries. It's not what I wanted. Okay. All right. So which now, is a bummer because Janissaries goes away, which really does hurt me because I desperately wanted that to be able to kill... His, siege yeah. in in the east. Oh my! Wow. So wow. The thing about comets coming out is they signal the beginning of the end of the game, and it shows you how fast, how much faster a two-player game runs than a three or four-player game. Um, we don't have to choose them, but this shows oh, that whichever end point. game we're pursuing. Trade fair ended right there. Ran out of money. Oh, it ran out of money. Good yeah, call. Good Did call. the same thing. So it's yeah. just habit. So, sure. Good call. We're accustomed to having very rich markets that <laughs> always pay and, to and be more players the trade than fair. just the two player, right? Yeah. So as you were saying about the comments. Oh yeah. No, that that was it. So what are you thinking? <sighs> you bought you bought that uh, Elizabeth of Bohemia card. Oh, Re reading comprehension for the win. Um. I actually thought England was an option, so I think I will go ahead and, let's see, yeah, I got enough money there, we could, yeah, I think we will. All right, so I have one card left in my hand, I will play Elizabeth, Elzbita, uh, Bohemia, I can play uh, or claim Coronation. Uh, Hungary, Portugal, or the HRE. Well, I already have Portugal, so my only two options are Hungary, which, or the HRE. Right. And looking at the board, I will take the HRE. So okay. I will. Out of the Empire stack comes the Holy Roman Empire, and into your tableau. Yep. All right. So over here. So now, just like what happened pri previously. Oops. We'll actually shift these over a bit. There we go. And so now's where I'll talk about some of the details of the uh, potential victory conditions, now that we have some comments out. Oh, go ahead and place your trade concession. concession. So yeah. here we go. So we have a new empire, a yep. regime change. Ergo, I get another concession here to place it out. And we will. So this is the HRE. So my three options are here, here, or here. Now, it's important to note, these two are going to help with possible other actions, i.e. the vote, etc. And, and, and globalization victory, right. but not with getting paid. So let's go ahead and, I mean, if that had been claimed by me earlier, then obviously I would place it out, but why not get sure. the extra chance at more money? So that's one action. And if While he's thinking about perfect. his second action, I'm going to detail the four possible victory conditions, partly because we're coming up on them. The first and most kind of direct uh, the one that's, that has the easiest and most direct route to understand is the Imperial Victory. It is, in a two-player game, to have two more king cards in your tableau than any other player. In a three- or four-player game, that's three. Uh, and that's specifically Empire cards on their king side. So that's the Imperial Victory. Again, none of these are active yet, but they likely will be here in the next few turns. The next possible victory condition, and kind of easiest to understand, is the trade globalization victory. And it is to have two more concessions on the board than any other individual player, uh, which right now, Edward has one more than me and is well positioned to continue putting trade concessions out. And to have more trade or navigation prestige than any other player. Right now, Edward has two of those just in his tableau, one for Portugal and one on his Indian, uh, the Company of Merchants card. And so he's possibly well positioned for this endgame uh, end victory condition. And w read that again for the sure. two-player? There's so, no changes, right? There's no change. Uh, so for the Imperial victory, uh, the change for two-player is written right at the bottom in, uh, in red. I'm sorry. 
in a two-player game, it's to have three more kings than any other player. In three or four-player games, it's to have two more than any other player. So that's the imperial victory and the globalization victory. The next is the Renaissance victory. And this is, this is have republics in your tableau. More republics than any of your opponents and two more law icons than any other player. Republics happen when you have when you have an empire, generally speaking, in your tableau, and you conduct the vote op on it. Uh, there's other ways to do it. Uh, you can run a conspiracy against your own empire. That's called a straw man uh, regime change, either peasant revolt or conspiracy. Uh, you can do it that way too, uh, but kind of the most, I guess, the most direct route to a republic is with the vote op. And that's one of those purple political ops. The last victory condition, which I don't think we'll see here since there's no bishops out yet, but the last is the holy victory. And uh, I'm not even going to detail it yet until the end uh, when we're kind of going through it. But speak, but st strictly speaking, to win, the vic to win the holy victory, you have to have more prestige in the supreme religion than anyone else. Right now in my tableau for the Ottoman Empire, I have one prestige in Islam. Um, it is not the supreme religion within the game terms. Uh, at this point in medieval Europe, it might be, it might not be. Um, and so we'll, we'll find out which victory uh, we're chasing here very soon. I really dislike all my options out here. <laughs> After all of that, I've been waiting, like, I'm like, yeah. That, um, no, I stalled no, as long no, as I, I could, no, man. I know. I'm just not super, super thrilled. Um, so what we will do is I will go ahead and pay one florin on the West Trade route, and I will go ahead and take the uh, merchants. You know, I lied. I will actually pay three. Yes, we will. We'll pay th Nope, I'm one buck short. Oh, that's so frustrating. Um, okay, fine. I will pay one, and I will take that card into my hand. That is the Merchants of the Staple. And... Yes. Yes, we will. Oh, it's only in the West. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's no bishops out here on the to be able to silence to where you cannot go on campaign right. um, in a perfect world with the Ottomans. And there is no card available to be able to do that. Um, Zanti, ah, there's just not a lot out here to be able to mess with you, unfortunately. Okay. So Some of the chat saying that, uh, that in a two-player game, they like to play with the three-player setup oh, just okay. to kind of stretch it out a little more. We would but, prefer to yeah. play it as written and then yeah. make, make that there, a, Those are those aware. kinds of house variants that are... Uh, that are available for, you know, so many of these games. And the reason I don't want to play the card that I just got out of my hand is because it allows me to place a concession in England. Which doesn't do him any good no, right now. No, and I would much rather sit on that. Um, That's not helping you. And, uh, you know, I could... Hold on. Yes, I think we will actually uh, make sure. Now, this is where Ash's experience, even though I have seven games under my belt, this is where uh, I'm still rusty. So here we go. So I have two Florins left. Um, none of the cards are super exciting to me. I have one hand card here. So I'm going to go ahead and run the West yep. Ops, okay? Cool. Which means I get to go ahead and uh, do one... one uh, one tableau or uh, one action on every card. So I can't do a trade shift. That's a one shot. So this card does me no good. Both of the queens do me no good. Well, meaning I can campaign. So to campaign, and actually I will show you guys this while we do this. And hopefully you guys can make it out. So campaign ops. So knights on the map are for attacks. Right. And knights adjacent and rooks adjacent are it weakens me but that's okay is it yes <laughs> now i'm getting paranoid looking over um yeah we we are still going to so the campaign ops so any of the knights on my card 
which I'm going to be running from Portugal. Right. Uh, and then any adjacent, diagonal is adjacent in right. this game. So from Portugal, they can't see that. these Hold three. On. Oh, um, And then, then the result is me weakening uh, nations around me to be able to take them over. Well, I have England and I have Portugal. I'm sorry, I have Portugal in the HRE. I have no knights in the HRE, HRE starts so with that no doesn't knights. make sense. Right. So Portugal is my other option. So I can attack any of these three. Mm -hmm. And looking, I, I would like to uh, try to assert pressure sure. on the eastern side. I cannot from the HRE, so we will from Portugal. So I'm going to go eastward, young man. Okay. So it's my knight. I must pay one florin for every knight, so I will pay that to China. Then on Aragon, there is one knight, so that is a one-to-one. -one. Yep. Those die. There are no remaining knights on the attack. Right. Ergo, I cannot conquer Aragon. However, I have made it weaker to where I then can. You're set up to do it over. next time. Right. right. Hopefully. And well, this is this is where this game you have to kind of try to plan multiple turns in advance for what you're going to do. And mm -hmm. I am not going to campaign for the HRE because I have no knights, so I am done with my West Ops. Right. And that is the end of my turn. Yep. So then we have the market refill. And here's where we're going to see one of the other kinds of one-shots and potential regime changes in a conspiracy. I'm going to purchase this card, the Order of Santiago. I have only two, two cards in my hand. And now I'm going to play the Order of Santiago. It goes into my West Tableau. So here, if you want, put it out here yeah. so folks can see it. So here's what... I'll hold it and you do thanks. it. Thanks. Here's what the Order of Santiago has. It has a conspiracy one-shot and brings with it two knights. The way a conspiracy works is the attackers are the agents on the cards and any repressed nobility being knights or rooks on that empire card. Uh, and it's just like an attack. The attackers are the, are the agents on the card, non-bishop agents on the card, repressed knights or rooks, which we have none right now, and the defenders against the defenders who are all the map pieces on the card. In this case, Oops. one lonely rook. <laughs> and so in this case, I choose to run the conspiracy op, you betcha, we have two attackers, one defender, they go one to one, and that causes a regime change for right. the... For, for Portugal. For Portugal. So here's what happens. The regime change, the queen does not come with it. The queen is out of the game. She goes away. And then I sadly say goodbye <laughs> to Henry the Navigator, and I regrettably hand him over. And so... Now that the Portugal is part of my tableau, there's a regime change. Haha, -ha, we get to trigger regime change. and Which means you get to place a concession. I get to place a concession. Now, I would very much like to repress this concession here that Edward has. However, I don't have the money to do it. I could pay one florin to repress it, and if so, it would then come onto the Empire card here. But I was not quite so parsimonious as I should have been, so instead I'll just put my concession here. Um, and that now goes onto the map card, which I'll put it there in, uh, in Granada over. And when you're placing your agents, this is a case of placing an agent. Again, you don't have to match what's on the map card. It and just so has to go into one of the cities. was any of those three cities. Right. And the reason you place it there was you don't want, for whatever reason, a black rook on here. You don't want a black the white knight, which would be defensive. Right. Or allow you to go on the offensive exactly. later on. Assuming that I can hang on to the, my newly gained empire. Uh, and that's my two actions. So that's it. Well, that sucked. All right. So, yeah. Um, so Nick asks about what the comet signal. Okay. So you guys can see out here on the right-hand side over here are the four in-game victory conditions. Not in-game triggers, but victory conditions. Those are all inactive. If you select a comet, instead of it going into your hand, you immediately trigger it, which means you flip one of those four victory conditions to the active side, and right. now somebody can possibly win. Claim victory. Right. You can't claim a victory until the it's victory active. condition is active. Right. So that's what those are, and neither of us... Eh, he is in position. Right uh, to answer your question, oh, Nick, no. um, really? it doesn't take an action to uh, use the comet card, but it does take an action to buy the comet card. And so in that sense, it does still take one action because you're buying it out of the market. It simply doesn't come into your hand. So if you happen to have two hand cards and you wanted to buy a comet, you still could. 
I have a feeling the game's going to be over in two turns unless I can do something. Maybe. I'm not sure. Oh, you have to have three more. Yes. Me. Not, not three, but three more. That's okay. correct. So right now, he has three empires, one of which is a vassal, and I have one. So one of these, and I believe it's the uh, age of, help me out here, feudalism, is the one oh. where you have to have three yeah. more than your opponent. Right. So he has three to one. And what I'm thinking about doing is trying to make it expensive for him to flip that. I don't want to make it easy on him to be able to flip that. So the, my first action, I hate just playing prevent defense, though. Um, yeah, let me think, let me think, let me think. Um, oh, oh. Okay, maybe maybe I look a little bit, we go about this a different way. Yes. Yeah. All right, so I am going to buy a card from the market. Uh, you're welcome, Nick, and good job, chat, kind of helping cool. to field the questions, too. It's a team effort. All right, so I play one. Uh, I'm going to purchase the Jewish Pirates, okay. and I shall play the Jewish Pirates, which, going into my tableau now, we have the east, so it says the east, so it goes into the east. There is no one shot, but it does have Arg. It has Arg. Arg. So, and it must be placed adjacent to Aragon. And oh, pirates, look at that! Oh, wouldn't you know? Hey, this pirate comes and says hi. Die. <laughs> so normally, yeah. whenever you remove a concession, it will go as a repressed peasant or repress peace onto whatever empire it is, if it's in play, be it Aragon or Portugal. However, in this case, it's a pirate. Pirates just kill. Yeah. They don't repress They're anything. They're not subtle. So, out with you. Well done. Thank you. So, that is first action. It's actually both of your actions, because you bought the card. Oh, and, and played, played it. it. Yeah. Okay. It's, so, it's so, I tough. have... So, this is where normally we think out loud. Um, in a two-player, zero-sum game... It's a little bit harder to do that, so I'm going to keep something, what my next plan is, under, That's okay. under my vest. Superb. Or, you know, keep it a little bit quiet and unveil it when it's possible. All right. If you subvert it, I will then talk about what it was what I was you were going, going to, to do. do. Sure. Okay, I think so, that's the best way to go about doing it. The card I purchased earlier is the Savafids, which I will now play. On it, it has a Jihad one-shot uh, targeted at Byzantium, and it additionally has a Black Bishop to be played. Uh... Now, all the one-shots, the Peasant Revolts, ref uh, Religious Wars, and Conspiracies involve the attackers, the non-bishop agents on the card. This is the bishop, so this agent won't be attacking. However, here's how Religious Wars work. Religious Wars work, first you need to have heretics on that map card, map card pieces of a different color. Uh, we jokingly say that nobody puts pants on for a bloodless religious war. So. Here in Byzantium... Uh, I want to kill somebody. Exactly. Why, why is it worth going That's for? That's the whole point of the religious war. Right. So, we do have, uh, as the game calls them, heretics, within uh, the map card of Byzantium. So, it will. the religious war is on. This jihad is on. The attackers for any religious war are the map pieces of the color indicated on the card. In a jihad, it shows a black crescent moon. Which, because those are Muslims. Right. So, black pieces on Byzantium. There's one attacker, one defender. Now, in addition to those attackers are any knights on bordering map regions. Here in the Ottoman Empire are two more attackers. So right now we have three attackers to one defender. This will be a successful jihad. Um, you know, I'll choose to take out this one here. And so we have, they kill one to one, and that's the end of the jihad. And there are survivors? There's surviving attackers, and so it's a successful uh, jihad in this case. It's a regime change. Now, religious wars are special, because on the back side of these map cards, all the map cards have a theocracy side. Um, in this case, it's a Muslim theocracy, in the case of Byzantium. Now, that said, Mamluk starts as a Muslim theocracy, and the Papal States start as a Catholic theocracy. They can each flip to a different theocracy side. And thematically, that's just when this game took place, those were the two How major it could have religions. Happened. Exactly. Right. So, Byzantium is now a Muslim theocracy, and Byzantium is now, there is a regime change, going to come into my tableau. And, oh, fancy that, with the regime change comes 
a trade concession. So that was my first action to play the card. <sighs> my second action is going to be to run the East oh, trade hold route. On, hold oh, on. sorry. Um, oh, the bishop. Thank you. So, on cards All where... Right, let me back it out. Yeah. Some one-shots involve the agent, as we saw previously with the conspiracy. Some cards don't. If you don't involve the agent, you, once you've run your one, your one shot or not, you then have the option to place the bishop, uh, place the agent. In this case, it's a bishop. When you place a bishop, it can go on to either the card that you've played, or it can go on to any other card with the same location indicated on the card. In this case, it could could go on to any other Byzantium card, or it could go on to any card that says the East. So in my case, he could place it on my tableau if I had any cards that said the Byzantium East or, or Byzantium, right. which obviously that being the East would only be on this side of my tableau. So we don't even need to look at the right side. That doesn't matter because those will never be uh, East side cards. Right. So here I only have Aragon, so he cannot place the bishop on my tableau exactly. yet. Now, uh, the way that a bishop works is a bishop silences shh, shh. any ops. Shh. <laughs> any ops. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> any. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm done. I think I got it out of my system. <laughs> any ops on that card that is not blue. So with the Sabafids, you can barely see here, it has the blue Inquisitor yeah, um, op. And it has another op that's a purple behead op. Right here. So this is the card in, in question. It has a bishop. He's going to place the bishop on that. And yep. exactly what he said. This Inquisitor action, when you run the East ops for you, is not silenced. You can still trigger that. Right. However, the behead, he cannot because the bishop is physically on that card. And shh. Right. Bishops, right. uh, bishop agent pieces exist only on tableau cards, and they exist specifically to silence, generally, other people's tableau cards. In this particular case, uh, I think I'm going to play him on a Byzantium card, another Byzantium card in my tableau, the Byzantine Empire. Um, I'll explain why here once, once uh, we have some lag time to fill up, but I think that's what I'm going to do, and... That's my first action for my turn. So for my second action, I'm going to run the East Trade Fair again, now that I have some more concessions to profit from. So we run the East Trade Fair, we add a florin, and so pay the instigator and pay each concession. One, One two, two, three. three. Now, and now, finally, in this case... There is money left over. Ergo, right. it made it all the way to Mamluk, so now you get to place a levy on each of those. Right. And here, let me go ahead and bring it back in. And there I'll just go. place them real quick without kind of yeah, discussing. Yeah, I, I, I think we've covered that pretty yep. well. So that's the end of my turn. The last card comes out and is discarded as part of the trade fair. Uh, in the rulebook, it talks about thematically how the discarding of yeah. the card is the injection of, of resources into the, into the market or the economy. You know what? Hold on one sec. Did you just... Nope. Where... The card that just left. Help me out. Oh, uh, it would be that one. But that was already face down. Okay. Nope. That wasn't it. All right. I had a plan now. Give me a moment. Let me remember what my plan was. I got so excited just watching <laughs> all that and, you know, got involved. And um, That was it. Uh, there... Okay. Let me make sure I'm not... So we have... Yes, we will. I have no money. Son of a biscuit! <laughs> <laughs> but there's some money in that West Trade route. Oh, and I have to, but... You have my, the game's over. There's nothing I can do to stop it at this point. I need a third action to be able to stop it. So I'm going to be sure. as if, okay, yeah. because the game is going to end on the is next Is this where turn. you reveal your evil, yeah, yeah, yeah. evil master plan? Well, it, it really wasn't a huge deal. It was just to try and thwart what it is you're trying to do. Right. I'm one action short. So here we go. So because I am broke, um, 
Yeah, I need a third action because I need to purchase that card and play it. So yep. here, well, I'm going to run the West Trade route. So you guys have seen this. I play one. I am the instigator. So I do that. Here we go. One, two. It stops right there. So mm -hmm. I will get these three. I then, oh, uh, and see, and that, that negates it as well. If I had two Florins, I was going to purchase the... Uh, Camaros Guild? Camaro? Yeah, go with it. Uh, Camaros Guilds and then play it for the Peasant Revolt. Yep. Okay. In Portugal. Um, so before I place levies, let me go ahead and explain how sure. that would have played out. Okay. So to show folks. Yeah. Because it's it's a cow's opinion. It's, it's moo at this point. So if I had been able to do this, okay, I would say, hey, I'm going to play the Camaros Guilds out of my hand. Oh, surprise. All right. Camun Eros. Yeah. So I play it, and then the Peasant Revolt would trigger, right. or I, I could choose to, and yeah. I would. So the Peasant Revolt is a type of civil war. So here's what uh, a Peasant Revolt. All the attackers are agents on the acting card. That's one on the card. Okay, one then attacker. every serf in that empire, so let's take a look here. There are... No repressed, there's no pieces on Portugal. So but there we, would have been had I been able to afford to do so. Correct. Then your bordering concessions, meaning the player who played it, I have one on Portugal. So That's right two now, attackers. That, thank you. And bordering pirates. Ah. So this is where me having played these guys, the Jewish pirates matters. last turn, matters because that would have given me an additional one. Actually, it still would work. So let me go ahead and back up real quick and place the levies. Okay. So here... I will place that. It didn't make it all the way through. It stopped here, and uh, England is saturated. Yep. All right, so we're now at three attackers. Three attackers. Right now, two defenders, thanks to Edward running the trade route. Right, knights and rooks on the map card, mm -hmm. so it would be three to two. I would then take that empire back from you, and then it would only be three to two as opposed to four to one. Oh, so sad. And I'm one action short, so... Yeah. So, so wait, why are you one action short? Because you're because like, oh, I ran the trade fair it, and I have to play it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I can't stop you because there's too many comments out here. Yep. So that's that. Okay. So I now have three Florins on the Medici. So, hey, great. If this were to go one more turn, I would be able to, you know, stop him from winning and change things up. But as it is, I can't have played this present revolt. Instead, it's in my hand. I now have two hand cards, and there we go. That's where we're at. So, so, Ash, go ahead and show them how it's done. Here comes the end game. No, you cannot win. Yes, you can. Yes, Never I mind. can. Yes, you can. So, I can actually win, I think, in two different ways. Uh, and I'm going to <laughs> use this chance to finally describe the last of the four victory conditions that I haven't yet detailed. I'm going to buy the Comet. Oh, right. No, excuse me. Just one. One, sir. I'm going to buy the Comet. It Does it does not ahead. enter your hand. It's immediately discarded. And when you do so, yeah, it says so on the card. And even the iconography says when purchased, flip a V. Discard and flip an inactive victory card. I'm going to choose to flip the holy victory card. And that's because, partly to show off a little bit, haha, -ha, um, <laughs> but also for the sake of teaching to actually finally explain in full detail what the religious victory is. And real quick, before... The other one that he could have to win the game is the Imperial is, Victory. Which is to win, you must have at least three or more king cards than any of your opponents. So, as you guys can see, he has one, two, three, four. Four and to Edward's be, one. Because he took Portugal from me earlier, and I have one. So, four right. minus three, or four minus one is three, and there you go. So, this is the easiest in the game, I yeah, feel, to I think be able to play. In so most games, it's going to be the easiest. So Ash is going to show off, and go ahead. <laughs> here's a little showing off, uh, a little hot rodding. Here's the here's the holy victory. All right. So you must have the most prestige, and uh, we've been kind of gently referencing these little ovals on the cards. Those are prestige icons in the supreme religion. Now, in our game, at this moment, Islam is the supreme religion, because the supreme religion is defined as... More one. bishops than all the other religions combined in play. Islam has one, the others have zero. So, one to zero, that's more than all the others. And more map pieces living in its theocracies than all the other religions combined. Of its color. Of its color, right. So, 
in this case, uh, the Muslim theocracies are Byzantium and Mamluk. Living in those theocracies are one, two, three map pieces of the right color, so three black pieces in Muslim theocracies, versus, in the Papal States, one white piece living in a Catholic theocracy. So again, uh, you need, for, for the supreme religion to be determined, it must have more bishops in play than all the others. Combined. Combined. Uh, that's white and red, or whoever you're trying to determine is supreme. And more map pieces of its color in its theocracies, in matching theocracies, than both others combined. Note, if the Protestant uh, theocracy was in play, it sure. would be the Papal States and the, uh, the, the Protestant... Uh, sure. Let, just, sure. Just for the example, let's say, oh, let's say that France became a Protestant theocracy. And you Over can here. see the red cross versus the white cross. And let's just say through the course of the game that that white knight somehow stuck around. That white knight doesn't count for the Protestant theocracy because it's a non-matching piece, so a color piece. Do the count again. We, so we've this, covered the bishops. In this count, one, two, three black pieces in black theocracies versus one, two of the other religions matching pieces in their matching theocracies. And again, the Catholic knight does not matter because he's in the home of Protestant uh, of Protestantville. Exactly. Okay, so uh, yeah, so it'd be one, two, two. not three. If exactly. it were three, that would negate it. Right. So, so, so hold on. That would mean there's no supreme religion in the game. But as it stands, that's what we have right now. What did you want to... No, no, you're fine. That's good. Yeah, so... As it stands right now, Three versus one, one versus zero, and I have two prestige for Islam. Edward has zero, and so all I've, of those conditions must be met. All of those conditions must be met for you to win via the holy victory. That's why we didn't explain it before. Because it's the most convoluted, most complex, uh, not the hardest, but the most complex. I to think. kind of determine the game yeah. state. But now, actually, I'm really glad we got to see this. So that was all part of the master plan, obviously. Right. So. Uh, as the beginning of the rules kind of allude to, you can either be high-minded and highfalutin and go for a Renaissance victory where people live and vote in free republics or trade across the globe, or you can put all of Europe under your heel in an empire or, in this case, uh, religious totalitarianism. All right, so 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 that was me getting my ass kicked. <laughs> no, 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 it's all good. No, no, no worries. Um, I usually, people know this, I, I'm terrible during the live stream. You're Plus, running, you're basically running a spaceship trying to stream and play a game you're at the fine, same time. No, I, I think that played out completely different yeah. than the last game did than oh, when yeah. we played it four players. Yep. Um, so, okay, you now have close to 10 plays. I think, I think I'm at 10. I okay. think I missed logging one. I think I'm at 10 now. Thoughts? Um, I still love the game. After 10 plays, I'm still exploring uh, what the game can produce. It varies based on what cards come out, what cards aren't even in the game, based on how the decks get sorted. Uh, there's a whole stack of cards from East and from West that aren't in the game at all. And that changes how the game plays out. Not to how, mention the expansion. The expansion, which I haven't even played yet. Uh, how the players play the cards changes uh, how, how you get into them. And I don't want to spill the beans too much on my thoughts um, for the review coming up, but uh, I think that chess as the underlying kind of analogy within the game is very appropriate. Um, it's very ambitious, but it's also very, very appropriate. This game has a great deal of depth, and it has a lot to explore. Um, and, and I'm glad that I've now seen it at two players, too, um, because it's, it's even a little bit different at two versus four. It really is. And uh, as you alluded to, we are going to be reviewing this two weeks from Thursday. Uh, on the show, on the podcast, you and I actually are going to record it this week while it's fresh yeah. in our heads and everything else, uh, but it's not going to air for a couple of weeks. This is now seven or eight plays for me okay. of this, and I'm finally, aha, like I saw how to yeah, yeah, work yeah. You at saw least your path. one of them, I, at least one of the things. I let you take over the East far too much, um, and that's due to my still being in the rules and the mechanics well, of the game. you had a stranglehold on the West, commensurate. Sure. And the cards didn't play out, which I'm totally okay with, yeah. because thematically, I appreciate the, the variance, and you have to make lemonade out of lemons, yep. right? I liked it a lot at two. Um, I feel like it's a lot more, you know, knife, knife fight in a phone booth type mm -hmm. thing, uh, even more so than in three or four players. Sure. 
Uh, I do want to explore the idea of playing with a three-player setup, yeah. as uh, the peanut gallery alluded to, for basically what that means is it's going to add more cards into each of the East Draw decks, decks yeah. so that the comets, so basically it prolongs the game a little bit. Yeah. Because the time frame on this game, I believe, is like 45 minutes to an hour and a half or thereabouts. It says one to two hours. Okay, which feels honest once you, when we're not streaming it, when we're not doing all those once things. Once you know the rules and once you're up to speed and you can just break it out and play, yeah, it yeah. plays really that fast. That said, it is, for me, Having played High Frontier twice in the last week and a half now, <laughs> this is still the hardest game for me to wrap my head around. Yeah. It, uh, High Frontier pales in comparison to this for me okay. because that it. Not saying that this doesn't make sense. It does. It's just the opacity of your decisions uh, is a lot more uh, well opaque sure. <laughs> uh, than in. A, even a heavy game like like High Frontier. There's more layers going on with each action totally. and each kind of the, the repercussions. And, and there, there's more things that you need to be aware of to mm -hmm. defend against yep. in this. Um, I think this is fantastic. I also think that if you said, hey, would you like to play a Renaissance game? My, my base of reference is two games. Okay. Pax Renaissance or Virgin Queen. Okay. There's no competition for me. Yeah. I think it would be this far and away because okay. this distills everything. Not everything. Obviously, it abstracts a ton of it out. All the way down to the flavor text. I mean, so much of it's just in italics on, right. on the cards. I would much prefer this in an hour or two versus Virgin Queen in 8 to 10. Yep. I think this does a better job of cool. what that does in my opinion. But yeah. again, that's kind of apples to bananas. It has the same theme, but they're completely different in scope, Yep, I feel like. So yeah, fantastic game. Uh, big fan. Uh, and I think I, I think it's safe for me to say that it's it may eclipse Pax Porfiriana as my favorite. Wow. Uh, but we'll save some of this for the review. Cool. cool. All right, so let's see. Um, Can we cover some of the rules that we didn't oh, encounter absolutely. in the course of play? Is there anything we need to look at the board? Uh, very quickly, I want to cover how some of the other ops work, um, no, just so that if we encounter... Do you not yeah, want to? Yeah, we can. Okay. Uh, we'll leave it up to the peanut gallery. All if right. you guys want to, then we will. If not, then we will uh, We will move on. So um, let me, while we're waiting for that to take place, let me sure. see. Um, uh, so Andy and Jose are talking about the, the some of the cards in the expansion can be rather swingy. They can be, yeah. Okay. Um, and I haven't even played it yet, and I don't know if I like it or not. Right. But yeah. I've yeah. heard I've heard people go both ways on yeah, it. Yeah. Let's go ahead and finish it. Let's go ahead and show folks. So, okay. Here. So we've covered all of the one shots. We've right. covered con coronations. We've covered conspiracies. We covered a hypothetical peasant revolt, and we covered some religious wars and the trade shift. I'll note that the trade shifts for the Black East trade route can move. However, the trade shift to the Spice Islands is permanent. It's never going back. So, in other words, I cut the legs Once, out from you yep. on the, e on on the, the, west, uh, trade the west trade route. Right. Once that happens, it ain't never going back. Okay. Now, that said, I think we even saw all of the agents played or involved in some, por some course of the game. So now, let's cover all the different ops that we didn't see. Um, here, we'll, we'll start with the stuff on my tableau here. Yeah, sure. All right, so we have Repress. Go ahead, you take it from there. So, so we have Repress, which is a pawn specifically. Right. And repress will say which piece type you're repressing in that region. So for every repress, you start, you get a florin. There you go. Whee! You get a florin for repressing the piece. And in this particular case, he's repressing a pawn in from Aragon, Aragon or bordering Aragon. So for instance, if there were a pawn, a pawn there next to Aragon, he would say, I'm repressing this piece. Um, other repress icons may have a knight or a rook, and in that case, you're repressing it from that empire. When you repress it, it goes onto the empire, assuming that it's in play. Now, in this case, it's not in the stack, so it just comes back out of the game. It dies. But if it were, it would go onto that piece as a repressed piece and would participate either in a conspiracy, if it's a knight or a rook, or a peasant revolt, if it's a pawn. Exactly. Which, in this case, it would be a peasant revolt because right. it's a pawn. Right. All right. So that's, uh, that's repress. And, um, and, and you get a florin for your trouble. Then, 
we have Corsair here, which yep. this has to do with Erg pirates. pirates. And specifically, this is black pirates mm -hmm. in this case. All right, so again, bordering Aragon. Oh, hey, look, we have a black pirate bordering Aragon. So that means he can move to the any other uh, water side mm -hmm. because pirate. there are no land pirates. These are only ocean pirates or water pirates. <laughs> uh, so he could come over here if I wish, which I probably wouldn't. But if, and then... It kills, the, kills any other piece that's there. Correct. When they land there. Important note. It does not repress them because pirates do not take captives. They simply kill. And you know that because on the Corsair uh, icon is a skull and crossbones sin signifying that whatever is there at the arrival is killed. Yep. All right. That's all that I have on my tableau. Let's see so, what we have. Do you uh, have something? After Corsair, uh, the, other, the other red ops we already saw campaign, the one we didn't see is Siege. Okay. And here, the way Siege works is... It'll be a skull and pro it's red with skull and crossbones and a knight and a rook. And what that does is lets you kill one map piece, i.e. knight or rook, in that location. That Vlad the Impaler lets you siege in Hungary, and so, boop, lets you just kill one map piece in that, in that location. On the Easy. map card, because On the map that's card. only going to be a knight or rook. Right. Uh, and that's the piece. Uh, one of the other political ops that we might have seen, had I gotten to keep playing, is Behead. There's no need for that jab. <laughs> there was no need for that. Um, so, the way that Behead works... Glory to romance. <laughs> ...is when you choose that op, it kills Beheads from someone else's tableau, one other card, or one card with the same location. And here's where that interchangeability of Hungary is in the east, and so Vlad the Impaler affects both Hungary and a card that says the east. Um, there's no examples right now, but let's say that he had Vlad the Impaler and I had the Hungarian Empire. He can also behead not just any tableau card that says Hungary. Uh, there's no good examples. He can also behead the Hungarian Empire. When he does so, if you behead an Empire card, you also lose the beheading card. Right, um, so Vlad would die, but Vlad he died die, a hero. But he died a hero, killing, right. beheading this Empire. Yep. Uh, that's how behead works. We talked uh, about the Inquisitor. Yeah, we talked about the, uh, the blue ops, uh, the Inquisitor. Let's see. Tax? Tax. Here's a good and example. Tax and vote, I think, are the only two left. Yep. So, um, we saw Commerce. That's the only gold uh, op. Uh, so tax, the way it works, tax lets you target one levy, so you target a specific levy. My card here says Portugal, so I'm going to target Edward's levy here. Oh, excuse me, Edward's concession. Uh, target the pawn, Edward. As the owner of this taxed concession, you must either pay one florin to the bank to keep it there, or remove it. I'm looking for, we, we have no vote cards, oh, actually, in the um, entire Oh, deck. here's the, yeah. There you go. All right, go ahead. This Keep game going. was, this, and there's an example. This game was never going to go the way of the Renaissance and Republic. There we go. Good call. So, the way the tax works, you target Sorry. a specific concession bordering the map location. So, Edwards, please pay one florin if oh, you want to keep that there. Fine. There he pays it. And now he, the taxed player, chooses a piece to levy onto that map card. And here, in this particular example, there's only one choice. You mind popping a knight there onto my empire? Yeah, it makes him stronger. Thanks, buddy. However, had it been like this, I would not, you would not be able to tax me. You're right. Because it's already saturated? Exactly. So if you cannot add via a tax action, you cannot right. tax the people. Right. And so like with trade routes that add the levies, a tax adds a levy. And if a map card saturated, you can't run the tax op. Different, uh, different, uh, really? Different than a trade route, which you just skip it yeah. and move on. Whereas this, you cannot actually take the action itself. Exactly. Um, so that's the tax op. And then last, we have the vote. The vote. So here's how voting works, and it's one of the more complex ops to deal with. And this is actually was something I was looking to looking try to and do. do, but there was never going to be, in hindsight, do you a have tax a, card. Do you have a vote in England card? Uh, uh, boy, you ask a lot of me. Oh, uh, um, so, no, hold on. I will try and find one. Give me one moment. Okay. Stall. While he's fishing, um, the way that vote works, it's the most, A, it's the most direct route to creating a republic. And when you do so, 
Have one in the West. Okay. That'll work. Yeah, a vote. That's the thing. The vote op will always say vote East or vote West. All right. So we have the, the West and a vote. Right. And the vote has the uh, king uh, piece symbol right. on here. So first, for a vote to be run, the empire must be in play. It can't be in the stack. It also cannot be a vassal. Uh, people, a vassal kingdom can't vote their way out of vassalage. That's not how medieval <laughs> Europe works. That's not how any of this works. That's not how any of this works. But let's say that England is in play and Edward wants to run a vote on it. It's I over here like in my tableau. run a vote on so, that. So it must be in play either in, someone, uh, in someone's tableau on the top. Then the person conducting the vote must have more concessions bordering that map region than anyone else. In this case, Edward has two. I have zero. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Next. He would then pay one florin for every repressed piece on the card. Which, right now, there's none, so but I had that happened, money. he would pay one florin per. And now, this empire comes to him, flipped over, on the Republic side. And because you can tell the Republic because it has a scroll icon versus the crown. So here is the Republic of England into your tableau. Which, that would then go like so. And you notice possible ops. It's a change of regime. Ergo, I would then get to place a concession yep. if I wished. And then whenever I run the West ops, I now have those. And thematically, it makes total sense. People are voting right. for the Specifically, Republic. the people that you're telling to vote are right. voting for that Republic. Right. Uh, something to note, all of the empires on their Republic side have a very different set of ops than their kingdom side. Right. Um, generally, they all have commerce. Some of them, like England, uh, Holy Roman Empire, have a vote icon. Once you make a republic, it's much easier to make more money and make more republics. Um, cool. I think that's it. And that's, that's everything yeah. uh, that we've covered. Fairly concise, relatively speaking, I think. <laughs> I mean, what time is it? It's been... We started at, what, 11? It's not yeah. even one, an hour and 45 minutes thereabouts, yeah. including a, a couple-minute intermission due to the technical issues. Um, but, yeah, overall, I think that went really well. So hopefully uh, hopefully you all did as well. Um, any questions? I didn't see anything. I, I saw a bunch of people, uh, Andy in chat and a few other people talking about it. Um, uh, Jared's asking if it only comes on the king side, if it comes from another tableau. Uh, so that's where the chart on the back of the rule book comes in handy. Generally speaking, yes. The only way it can become, if it, so I have to be very careful with how I say this. If you're doing, if it's in someone else's a tableau and you do anything but a vote, it comes to you as a king. If it's in someone else's tableau and you do a vote, it comes to you as a republic. Now, that said, if it's already in your own tableau, and i.e. not a vassal, um, you can do what's called the straw man, uh, peasant revolt, conspiracy, or uh, religious war. Any kind of empire change. Regime change that's not a campaign. your own tableau, right. it becomes a Straw republic. man, it flips and becomes a republic. There you go. Cool. Awesome. People best are of like three. best of three. <laughs> no. All Lift right. the cameras off. It'll go faster. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. right. So any questions on y'all's end? It doesn't look like it so far. Um, so cool. All right. Good. All right. Great. So, hey, first off, thanks for teaching it. Again, You're welcome. Ash, I definitely appreciate that. You are a lot smoother on this game than I am. It, and it's just valuable. practice. It's so, just practice. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Happy to for, do it. Uh, for y'all, uh, we appreciate y'all watching, especially. And hopefully we made either your work day go by. Or you, if you're over the pond, over in Europe, uh, you were able to join us. So awesome. We appreciate it. If you like what we're doing here, then uh, like, subscribe, the video, everything down below. We have promoted and mentioned what our next week and a half of live streams are. You can see us on uh, the last video that we just made. We did that Twitter, Facebook, our webpage, BGG, a whole bunch of places. Also, um, none of this happens. And without our patrons, which we're up to 214. This is our count. So thank you, patrons. This studio is because of them. And so if it's something that you want to support, we would definitely appreciate it. You can go to patreon.com forward slash heavy cardboard and, well, become a patron. Pretty cool perks. Uh, you can check them all there, uh, all out there. We have a pretty active Slack channel for patrons. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. that's about it. Yeah, that's great. Cool. Congratulations. Thanks, man. All right. 
we'll catch y'all, all right. uh, I guess, Wednesday with Nuno and Paulo. Wow. Yeah. Excited. Looking for that. Catch y'all later. Bye-bye, everyone.